In Miami, a young man is abducted at gunpoint. The kidnappers demand a fortune and threaten to kill. The police and FBI uncover disturbing leads and look for answers in the smallest clues in a desperate race to find the victim and bring him home to his family. Kidnapping can shatter a family, bringing terror and heartache without warning. In 1984, with the flash of a gun, an ordinary business transaction became a violent abduction. In seconds, the son of a wealthy Miami developer was gone. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The kidnapper's motivation seemed to be money, but agents would learn this case and its resolution were more complicated than anyone believed. Miami, Florida, Tuesday, August 7th, 1984. At six o'clock, the sales office of real estate developer Jesus Portella was closing. Mr. Portella had emigrated from Cuba 22 years earlier, building a successful business in Miami. His 22-year-old son, Mario, was recently married and worked as a salesman for his father. As did Mario's uncle. A little after six, a couple approached the office. Mario and his uncle went out to talk with him. The couple asked about condo prices. The man seemed anxious as they spoke. The uncle explained that the office had closed. He asked them to return in the morning. At the couple's request, he went inside to get some brochures for them. He didn't see what was happening outside. An armed man had pulled up, and the three were abducting Mario. The uncle spotted temporary tags on the car, but only got the last three numbers. He told Jesus what he saw, Mario forced into a blue and gray car, heading north on 122nd Avenue. Then he called the police. But Mario's father couldn't wait for the police to arrive. He went looking for his son. Soon he spotted a car matching the description of the kidnapper's vehicle. For years, he had carried a licensed gun for protection. Now, he was ready to use it. But it was the wrong car. Realizing he couldn't find the kidnappers himself, Jesus returned to wait for the authorities. The Metro Dade police responded to the kidnapping call. 
for Detective Alvaro Romero, abductions were not unusual in 1984. At that time, we were inundated with kidnappings. We had probably one kidnapping a month related to narcotics or drug-related kidnappings, where the victims would either be involved in drugs themselves or possibly fam family members were involved in, in drug dealings. But detectives quickly realized Mario's abduction was different. Questioning Mr. Portella and, and recognizing the fact that he was a prominent businessman in the community led us to believe that it was not narcotics related and strictly a financial gain for, for the people who kidnapped his son. It meant anybody who knew of Mr. Portella's wealth could be a suspect. Hoping the kidnappers left some trace behind, crime scene technicians dusted the door for fingerprints. Mario's uncle believed they might have touched it as they peered inside. No usable prints were found. Less than an hour after the kidnapping, the phone rang. Hello? Speaking in Spanish, the caller asked for Mario. Mr. Portella didn't recognize the voice. The caller then announced he was part of a terrorist group that was holding Mario for $3 million in ransom. Although no recording equipment was in place, a Spanish-speaking detective listening in identified the caller's accent as Colombian. The caller threatened to kill Mario if Jesus notified police or the FBI and warned that the group was watching the Portela house and gave the address. The distraught father pleaded to speak with his son. The kidnapper announced he would call Jesus' home in three days. Police could not trace the call, but it helped them understand the type of criminal they were facing. We felt the kidnappers were very violent. Uh, they took precautions as far as the phone calls that they were making, and uh, they were very serious in their threats. They knew what they were doing, and we took them very seriously. As with any kidnap for ransom, Metro-Dade police called the Miami field office of the FBI for assistance, and the case went to Special Agent John Gill. The FBI was involved from the very onset. The very fact that a large ransom was demanded uh, caused it to fall into the jurisdiction of what we call the Hobbs Act. The Hobbs Act makes extortion affecting interstate commerce a federal crime and Mr. Portella's business reached across state lines. Agents from the FBI's reactive squad installed recording equipment on Mr. Portella's office and home phones and arranged to have all incoming calls traced. The next day, Special Agent Gill wanted to talk with Jesus Portella, but not at the trailer or at home. He asked Jesus to meet him at an empty garage. Agents watched the entrances and exits of the garage for any sign of the kidnappers, but did not see anyone. As far as they could tell, it was safe for Gil to question Mr. Portella. Portella. Yes. My name is John Gill. I have been assigned the administrator the agent asked if Mr. Portella knew of anyone who had a grudge against him or if he had ever been threatened. The worried father could think of only one minor incident. He said that eight months earlier, a man and woman burst into his office. He knew the woman. Her name was Rose de Parias. She recently purchased a condominium from him and said she discovered her neighbor's payments were lower than hers. Mr. Portella explained that the difference was because the neighbor had obtained a better finance rate. It was between the buyer and the bank. The payments were not made to him at all. The financier had paid for the condominium, and he was out of the picture, so to speak. The two refused to accept the explanation. 
The man began threatening him, demanding that Portella refund the money. But there was nothing he could do. Before they left, Rose de Parius vowed she would get her money back one way or another. Mr. Portella had reported the incident to police. And the police talked to this particular woman and explained to her the circumstances of financing an interest payment. And she apologized, and Mr. Portella just assumed that this had all gone away. Agents later tracked down Rose de Parius and learned she was living in another state during the kidnapping. When they confirmed her alibi, they ruled her out as a suspect. Investigators were getting worried. With each day that passes, the chances of finding a kidnapping victim alive drastically diminish. They hoped the kidnappers would call again. And victim, oh, we've got a if they did, the reactive squad was prepared, having wired Jesus Portela's home and office with telephone tap and trace equipment. Meet at his office, right? All right, I'll be there. Special Agent Gil Orantia and other investigators needed to be there to monitor the calls and run the equipment. But getting into the home unseen would be tricky. The initial calls and our indications were that they were watching his home, they being the kidnappers. We were concerned that they might be able to detect that I was coming in. They needed Mr. Portella's help. I was crouched in the back seat as we drove to his home. We went into the garage and then we went into the house. We wanted to be able to record the phone calls and be able to capture everything that was said to him regarding any ransom demands. Agents and Metro Dade detectives would take shifts staying with the Portella family 24 hours a day. They briefed Jesus on how to handle the calls. He would be the lead in the effort to get his son back. One of the things early on, obviously, was to determine if he's even alive or not. And we discussed with Mr. Portella some of the things that he could ask the kidnappers, which only Mario Portella would know, proof of life questions, if you would, that could come back to us to verify, yes, we know he's alive. In building a profile of Mario with details about his life, including favorite foods and names of pets, the agents got to know the young man. Mario Portella was the all-American kid. He had gone to school. He had maintained outstanding grades. He had just gotten married to a, a young lady, and they were newlyweds with a bright future. Everybody loved him. The reason that uh, this case was so traumatic for so many people is that so many people could identify with them. They were the type of family that we all aspire to be, and uh, they were living the American dream, but they ran into a nightmare. As promised, the kidnappers called three days after the abduction. The caller ordered Mr. Portella to listen to a taped recording. The voice on the tape was Mario. He pleaded with his father to pay the ransom money, warning the kidnappers was serious and would kill him if he called the police or the FBI. Jesus told the caller he had discreetly begun the process of securing the money from his bank. Agents reminded Mr. Portella to ask the proof of life questions, including what Mario's nickname was as a child and the name of the dog his wife used to have. The man agreed to call back with the answers. Mr. Portella had kept him on the line long enough for agents to trace the call to a Miami payphone. But the caller had gone before surveillance units arrived. In the harrowing days after the kidnapping, Mr. Portella received several other calls. Speaking in Spanish, 
a different man talked vaguely and mysteriously of a business proposition apparently unrelated to the abduction. The demeanor of Mr. Portello at the time was, I really don't have time to talk to you about business uh, because I have other problems. This individual indicated on several calls that he, in fact, was a person uh, that could help solve the problems. His persistence in trying to communicate uh, his involvement in whatever Mr. Patello's problem was caused us to be highly suspicious that somehow he was playing a role or a part uh, in the kidnapping or the ransom demands. Jesus kept the man on the line, and investigators pinpointed the source of the call. It was coming from the same area as the kidnapper's earlier call. Surveillance units made it to the scene in time to spot the person on the phone. They followed him to a fast food restaurant where he emerged with a takeout bag. From their biographical profile of Mario, investigators knew the restaurant's burgers were his favorite. They then followed the man to an apartment complex where his behavior was even more suspicious. When he took the hamburgers to an apartment and delivered them through the door, having no conversation uh, with the recipient. Uh, and this was the brand uh, of hamburgers that Mario and his father uh, fancied. Yes, at that point, we were suspicious that perhaps Mario was being held at that location. The SWAT team responded and set up outside the apartment. The clock was ticking. They needed to find Mario. In Miami, the FBI and Metro-Dade police were trying to find Mario Portella and whoever kidnapped him. Their first good lead brought them to a Miami apartment where they believed the kidnappers might be holding Mario. The SWAT team quickly secured the apartment and searched each of its rooms. But Mario was not there. It had been a false lead for FBI Special Agent John Gill. It was determined not only by search, but interview of the people there, uh, that they were not related or associated with the kidnapping whatsoever. Interviewing the caller, Agents determined he knew nothing of the abduction and was merely trying to get work with Mr. Portella's company. Investigators again were forced to wait for the kidnappers to make the next move. Portella. It was the original caller. He answered the proof of life questions correctly, suggesting Mario might still be alive. That's correct. And again demanded $3 million. As instructed, Jesus tried to keep the caller on the line. He said he had spoken to the bank and could only come up with one third of the amount. As Mr. Portella negotiated, agents traced the call to another Miami payphone. Units were on their way. Eventually, the caller agreed to $1 million. Trying to stall longer, Mr. Portella said it would take time to get the money since the bank was closed for the night. But the man ordered him to have it ready when he called back in three hours with instructions for the drop. Once again, he disappeared before authorities could arrive. Within the hour, Mr. Portella met plainclothes agents at his bank. Looks like it's all here. Go inside there, the FBI recorded the serial numbers of the bills that made up the million-dollar ransom so they could be traced when the kidnappers spent them. At the Portella home, agents hid a tracking device in the briefcase, hoping it would lead them to wherever Mario was being held. The kidnappers called on schedule and gave Mr. Portella directions for the ransom drop. 
They ordered him to drive to a local restaurant, leave the car door unlocked with the money inside, wait for a call at a certain payphone, then go into the restaurant and sit down. The caller warned Jesus to go alone. With the loaded briefcases, Jesus began the trip. It took less than half an hour, but to the worried father, it must have seemed an eternity. The restaurant was in a tough and dangerous part of Miami. Undercover agents and Metro Dade detectives were already there watching. Agents also manned an empty apartment with a view of the restaurant. Jesus Portella arrived, carrying a million dollars in cash and hoping finally to get his son back. But he would soon discover that nothing was as the kidnappers said it would be. Jesus Portella was on his way to deliver a million dollar ransom in an unsafe part of Miami hoping to get his son Mario back. The way he handled the troubling and dangerous situation impressed the investigators working with him, including FBI Special Agent Gil Orantia. For him to have endured what he did, I have all the respect for him in the world. He performed very, very well. He did the things we asked him to. He did things that probably most of us couldn't do. The FBI and Metro-Dade police had undercover personnel staking out the restaurant. But the place was closed, and Jesus began to wonder if it was a setup. He found a payphone, though not where the kidnappers said it would be. He was nervous about leaving his car unlocked with a million dollars in it. He hoped the kidnappers would call before anything happened to him. If thieves made off with the money, he might never see his son again. Though he waited, the phone call never came. Eventually, Jesus had to leave with the ransom money, but without Mario. He and the investigators spent days waiting for the kidnappers to call again with new instructions. There were no ransom calls that came after the drop failed. We were concerned at that point because obviously um, our only connection to them were the phone calls. That was our connection to the bad guys. That was our ability to do something about what they were doing. And when they stopped calling, we became very worried. Although the kidnappers were not leaving new clues with ransom calls, older clues were beginning to pay off. FBI Special Agent John Hanlon was trying to find the car used in Mario's abduction. It was an older blue and gray four-door Chevrolet sedan and had temporary dealer tags, which were not in DMV databases at the time. And of course, with a paper tag, it can't be traced, so the car looks uh, perfectly legitimate and doesn't draw the attention of uh, law enforcement. Hanlon knew used car dealerships sometimes illegally rented cars that were for sale, placing temporary tags on them. He began phoning every dealership in the area. The time-consuming work paid off when Hanlon spoke to a clerk at one dealership in Miami. 
I asked her, you rent any old cars? And she said, sure, you know, and, uh, you know, any uh, old paper tags? And she said, yeah. And I said, any old Chevys? She said, yeah. I, said, I asked her, I said, any blue and gray ones? She said, yeah. I says, where is it? She says, it's here. And I said, well, uh, when, when, when was it rented? And she says, uh, uh, August the 7th. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. August 7th was the day of the kidnapping. When agents discovered the car had been returned the next day, they impounded it to have it searched for evidence. Metro-Dade forensics technicians processed the vehicle. They found no usable hair, fiber, or fingerprint evidence. But they did find a keychain under the back seat. The FBI knew that Mario Portella drove a Volvo. So we barreled back over there, picked up the keys, and we showed them to the family members. Of course, they identified them. It also fit his uh, automobile, and we took it by the house, and the house key fit his home. It meant that vehicle was most likely used to abduct Mario Portella. Checking records, agents learned a woman named Julita de Parias had rented the car. The clerk at the dealership said the woman came in with a man she said was her brother. Hanlon requested driver's license photos of Julita de Parias and her siblings. Nine days after the abduction, Hanlon met with the clerk who had rented out the car showing her a photo lineup that included a picture of Julita de Parias, along with several decoy pictures. The clerk identified Julita de Parias immediately. The clerk also identified the man who was with her. It was Julita's brother, Julio. Agents were familiar with the De Parias name. They remembered Rose De Parias was the woman who had had the dispute with Mr. Portella the previous year. Julita was Rose's sister. They now believed Julio De Parias was the man who accompanied Rose and threatened Jesus. Although the FBI still ruled out any involvement by Rose De Parias, her siblings were now prime suspects. Once we had good suspects in this investigation, we put surveillance on some of the members in an attempt to gather more evidence. The FBI noticed an unidentified man usually accompanied Julita. The couple seemed to be romantically involved. It had been 10 days since the abduction. Agents hoped the suspects would lead them to Mario Portella. They needed to question them, but doing so would alert any accomplices and put Mario's life at risk. We couldn't exactly jump them at that moment because we were trying to rescue this young man. That was our primary objective, to get this young man back to his family. So we continued to watch them. The FBI and Metro Dade surveillance effort included air and ground units. But the suspects seemed to be wary of a tail. They were very erratic uh, and paranoid in their behavior. Their driving would go in one direction and make a U-turn and go in another direction and then go through a parking lot and then in another direction, which was very taxing on our ability to surveil in as much as you only have a limited number of, of automobiles to conduct a surveillance. And when you're passing by the same subject three and four times in the course of one trip, uh, the chances of being identified as a surveillance vehicle are great. The suspect's counter-surveillance techniques worked. Following them exhausted the helicopter's fuel supply, forcing agents to turn back. Ground units tried to remain undetected and keep the suspects in sight, but soon they lost them. It was a difficult blow to the investigation. Three days later, 
and 25 miles north of Miami, in the town of Davie, Florida, two teenagers were walking in a field when they made a grim discovery that would provide terrible answers to a family hoping for the best. 13 days after Mario Portello was kidnapped, teenagers discovered a body in Davie, Florida, 25 miles north of Miami. Davy police realized it was a murder. The man's head was completely wrapped with duct tape. Detective Ed Taylor faced the challenge of identifying the victim. All we knew at that time was it was a male. We didn't know how old he was because his entire head had been taped. His hands had been taped behind his back and his ankles had been taped together as well. So at the scene, we really didn't have very much information as to the identity of the victim or how old he was or anything of that nature. They needed to examine the body, tape, and sleeping bag for more clues and remove the evidence to the controlled environment of the lab. Dr. James Ongley, then associate medical examiner for Broward County, performed the autopsy. He removed the duct tape surrounding the head careful to preserve each tear and section for later analysis by forensics technicians. With the tape off, Dr. Ongley could describe the victim as male, between the ages of 20 and 40, five foot nine inches tall, with brown eyes and brown hair. Although the victim had been severely beaten, the cause of death was asphyxiation. He believed the man had been dead for 24 to 36 hours. To aid in identification, Dr. Ongley photographed the victim for comparison with photos of missing persons. But he knew the pictures would not be accurate representations of the victim. The tightly wrapped duct tape had distorted facial features and the summer heat caused significant decomposition. We took uh, fingerprints from the victim so we could submit them to other departments to see if he had ever been arrested before. We uh, did a press release to the various newspapers with a description of the victim and ran a photograph of the victim to see if anyone could identify him. On August 25th, a Miami newspaper ran an article about the body found in Davie. FBI Special Agent John Gill noted the description loosely matched that of Mario Portella and immediately contacted the Davie Police Department about the abducted man. We had received prior dental records of Mario Patella from uh, his family dentist. And those records were in evidence uh, at the FBI office in the event that they were needed to identify a victim. Those records were brought to Davie, Florida. I met with uh, Detective Taylor, and we both proceeded then to the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. Ongley uh, was then capable with his experience to take those dental films or x-rays and compare them to the body and positively identify that body as being our victim, Mario Portella. For everyone trying to bring Mario home to his family, the news was devastating. We had to notify the Portella family that the victim had been identified and deceased. Now agents were investigating a murder. Reviewing the complex case, they outlined their suspects. Julio de Parias, the man who had threatened Jesus Portela the previous year. His sister, Julita, whose name appeared on the rental contract for the abduction vehicle and the man agents believed to be her boyfriend. All three had disappeared. Agents also developed another suspect, Hector de Parias, Julio and Julita's brother. He was close to his siblings and had a criminal record. Now with no chance of finding Mario alive, the FBI's investigation could be overt they interviewed the sister of three of the suspects, Rose de Parias, who had threatened Jesus Portella eight months before the kidnapping. 
She denied any involvement and offered her full cooperation. She said Julita's boyfriend was Jesse Ramirez, and that if he and the others could not be found in Miami, they most likely went to Los Angeles where they had friends. Miami agents forwarded the lead to the Los Angeles field office. There, Special Agent Gregory Pack knew they had no time to lose. It was imperative to find these people as soon as possible because they are dangerous people and uh, they are people you don't want on the streets uh, in your city or anybody else's city. Uh, if they did this once, uh, kidnapped and murdered, what's to say that they wouldn't do it a second time to some other victim? Special Agent Pack needed to narrow the scope of the search. He knew the suspects were of Colombian descent, and LA's Rampart District had a large Colombian population. I went out there with these very good photographs, and I went to all the places that uh, you and I would have to uh, go to occasionally uh, in a normal course of living, dry cleaners, restaurants, hotels, motels, apartments. After a couple of weeks of this door-to-door -door, you know, canvassing, I ran across a lady who was the apartment manager. I showed her the photographs. She recognized Hector, Julita, and Julio de Parias as new tenants, but said they seemed to be rarely at home. So I left my card with her and asked her if she would call me. And I called her at least once a day. This went on for probably eight or 10 days. Finally, in the evening, about nine o'clock, uh, I received a call from the office and this apartment manager was on the line and wanted to be Pat Shrew to me. So I accepted the call and she told me that the people that I had been looking for uh, were in the apartment now. We approached the apartment house, uh, took up various positions so there wouldn't be any escape out the windows or, or other doors. And as we ran in the front door, there was a gentleman pointing a revolver at us. So we tackled him, uh, wrestled the gun from him, uh, took him into custody, and then there was another uh, person there. The man with the gun was Julita's boyfriend, Jesse Ramirez. He was held on charges of assaulting a federal officer. The other man in the room was Hector de Parias, Julita and Julio's brother. He was held on a parole violation for drug possession and burglary. Two suspects were in custody, but two were still at large. We knew Julita and Julio were still outstanding. So uh, when we left, I had two agents remain at the apartment. Several hours later, Julita came back. She was taken into custody, and then she was brought down uh, to FBI headquarters in Los Angeles. Agents waited for Julio de Parias, but he never showed. The case agent in Miami, John Gill, learned of the arrests. Gregory Pack, the special agent in the Los Angeles division, called our division here in Miami. I was immediately on an airplane the morning of the telephone call, met with Agent Pack at approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Los Angeles, where I briefed him on our experience and knowledge of the case. Jesse Ramirez and Julita de Parias refused to talk to investigators. But Special Agent Gill and Davy, Florida Police Detective Ed Taylor had more success with Hector de Parias they needed his help to find the fourth suspect, Julio de Parias. And they needed to know the details of Mario Portela's last days. On September 24th, 1984, the FBI apprehended three suspects in the kidnapping and murder of Mario Portela. But a fourth suspect, Julio de Parias, was still at large. Only one of the three in custody, Hector de Parias, agreed to talk. Still, he was evasive at first, and investigators caught him in several lies. 
Davy Police Detective Ed Taylor and FBI Special Agent John Gill decided on the soft approach to get the truth. We befriended him in this style of interrogation, realizing that the potential was there uh, to develop trust and cause him to, in a sense, confess. On the second day of interrogation, he became cooperative to the point that he was right on the edge of divulging, divulging his criminality. As he became more trustful of Mr. Taylor and I, he advised us that, yes, he would cooperate and divulge details. He was not involved in the abduction. But several days after the abduction, Mario was being held captive in an apartment. The brother, sister, and the sister's paramour discovered that maintaining guard on a kidnapped victim is a lot of trouble, and they needed help. They knew that Hector was available, that he was unemployed, and that he was addicted to marijuana, could not get a job, and in fact would jump at an opportunity to participate in uh, a venture uh, with financial gain. So they solicited his help to watch a victim, as he put it. According to Hector, the motive for the kidnapping was actually revenge. Julio de Parias felt humiliated that he could not force Mr. Portella to refund his sister's money after she purchased her condominium. Hector said that after several days, his brother Julio and Jesse Ramirez worried about getting caught and gave up on trying for a ransom. They decided they had to get rid of the only link to them, Mario Portella. So on August 17, 1984, 10 days after the kidnapping, they decided to murder him. Jesse Ramirez began wrapping Mario Portella's head with duct tape as he pleaded for his life and prayed. As Mario struggled to breathe, Jesse beat him with a metal bar. After the murder, Julio de Parias paid Jesse Ramirez $1,000 for the job. Hector claimed to have no idea of Julio's whereabouts but he did know where Mario was held and murdered. Hector not only was able to give us an address of, a, of an apartment complex and the building unit, Hector was even able to draw us a diagram of the interior of the apartment, uh, where the various rooms were, furniture, where the murder had taken place. A team of agents, detectives, and forensics technicians rushed to the apartment in Miami. They secured it as a crime scene and processed it for clues. Any evidence recovered might help put Mario's killers behind bars. But seeing it brought back to investigators the disappointment of not being able to save the young man's life. Special Agent Gil Orantia was there. As we entered this apartment, we saw a roll of duct tape on the side of a nightstand. We saw a bar that we believe was used to strike Mario with. We saw blood in the apartment. We saw all of these things that sort of put this thing, for us, evidentiary-wise, together. But it was a difficult thing to look at. It was, um, it was a situation where, you know, our goal was to to do the right thing and get him saved, and we couldn't do it. And it was, it was tough. It was tough for us to look at that. In addition to duct tape, investigators found pieces of adhesive medical tape in the room. They also recovered hair and fiber evidence. Everything was cataloged and sent to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. There, Special Agent Hal Dedman of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit analyzed the items. Well, my involvement in the case dealt with the comparison of hairs, textile fibers, and tape from the four locations, the body recovery site, the apartment where the victim was held, 
a car that the body was transported in and another apartment where clothing from one of the suspects was recovered. He matched carpet fibers from those locations to samples found on the suspects and the victim. He also compared the tape wrapped around the victim's head, arms, and legs to the rolls of tape recovered at the murder scene. If you have two pieces of tape that were once original or adjoining sections of the same piece of tape and that tape is torn, the yarns are not all going to have the same appearance, they're not going to have the same uh, length. You'll have short pieces and long, long pieces. And you can fit these pieces of tape together much like you'd fit pieces together in a jigsaw puzzle. Special Agent Dedman determined the tear on the roll of tape from the apartment was a perfect fit with a piece of tape recovered from the victim's head. He also compared the tears on a strip of medical tape found on suspect Jesse Ramirez's shoes to those on the roll of medical tape found in the apartment and to those on a piece from the victim's body. It was another exact match. Each piece of evidence contributed and the result was that there was a tremendously strong association between the suspects in this case and the victim. Jesse Ramirez and Julita de Parias were found guilty on kidnapping, extortion, and murder charges. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Hector de Parias pleaded guilty to the same charges and received 40 years. But the fourth suspect, Julio de Parias, was still out there. We believe that he could have fled to Latin America somewhere. So we printed up wanted flyers that you'd find in your post office and police departments. We sent them all over the place. And we developed the same ones in Spanish. And we distributed them throughout Latin America. Almost four years after the kidnapping, in November of 1988, the FBI learned Costa Rican customs officials were holding a man who resembled the photo of Julio de Parias in the FBI's wanted poster. Special Agent Orantia flew to Costa Rica. The man did look like the photo, but it was his voice, the one from the ransom calls, that tipped Orantia off. I had listened to those phone calls over and over and over again, hundreds of times. I knew that voice. That voice was a part of me as much as anything's a part of me. So at the moment he opened his mouth, that was it. That was it. It cinched it. I knew it was him. The federal trial of Julio de Parias began five years to the day after Mario Portela's abduction. He was convicted of kidnapping, extortion, and murder, and sentenced to life. For the FBI agents who had gotten to know the victim's family, the convictions were important, but not the ending they had expected. This was a horrendous crime. For some type of justice not to come out of it would have been difficult for the community in Miami and for the family, and I'll be honest with you, for us too, the agents. So I think the, the idea that some type of justice occurred is paramount. That's, that's the only thing we can, we can cling to, all of us, that at least they were caught. The Portella family has persevered. They will never forget Mario, and they have not given up their dream. A mysterious woman lures a businessman across state lines with the promise of a lucrative deal. When he vanishes, authorities turn to the FBI for help. Suspicions point to a bitter business rival, but the suspect stonewalls investigators. Agents would use state-of-the-art technology to find friends and lovers who might be willing to reveal the truth.
wealthy businessman went to Florida to make one last deal before he retired, but he never returned home to his millions. Authorities examined who was closest to the victim and who stood to gain from his disappearance. But this time, conventional rules did not apply. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In a case that spanned the entire East Coast, agents would have to untangle a web of sex, money, and vengeance that led to murder. Newark International Airport in New Jersey. On Saturday, February 24th, 1996, Kiwi Airlines Flight 45 took off for West Palm Beach, Florida. 58-year-old Frank Black was on board. Black owned and operated a successful school bus and transportation company in Andover, New Jersey. Thank you. He had made millions and was on his way to Florida to meet a new industry contact. Black told his family and co-workers he would be home Monday in time for another meeting. He also told them that his contact in Florida, a woman named Mia Giordano, was to pick him up at the airport. She would take him to meet others involved in the lucrative business deal. Privately, Black hoped to retire after closing the deal. When Black failed to return on Monday, his family contacted the New Jersey State Police. Detective Sergeant Lee Liddy was one of the state detectives assigned the missing persons case. He was the kind of guy that he would always phone home. He always wanted to know what was going on with his business. He was a hands-on type of guy. Without Frank, the business really didn't run. And that's why they were concerned when they didn't hear from him. All of a sudden, he disappeared because Frank wasn't the kind of guy who would just walk away from his business. New Jersey investigators interviewed Black's daughter, Leanna, and his girlfriend and office manager, Sally Roberts. Leanna said her father had missed an important meeting with her to discuss the sale of his business. He also had not answered calls to his cell phone. Sally Roberts recalled that the woman from Florida, Mia Giordano, had phoned the office many times recently but never left her number. The Florida woman claimed to represent a company named Valdez Exporting. Giordano provided a description of herself so Black could recognize her at the airport. She said she was five foot one and blonde. A detective visited the travel agent who booked Black's trip. The agent confirmed that Black purchased a one-way ticket to Florida. He didn't bother to rent a car since his contact had arranged to pick him up. Airline records corroborated that Black had boarded the flight. But he had not registered at any hotels upon his arrival in West Palm Beach. An examination of Black's records revealed that his credit cards had been used after his arrival in Florida. To follow the credit card trail, New Jersey detectives contacted the Fort Pierce office of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll was assigned the case. Frank Black's credit card was used at the Embassy Suites in Riviera Beach between approximately 1 in the morning and 2 in the morning. Okay, now we're talking about from February 24th into February 25th. And then at four o'clock in the morning, his credit card, a different credit card, but his, Frank Black's credit card was used to purchase gas at a gasoline station in North Miami. To investigators, this seemed odd since he hadn't rented a car. The state agent interviewed the employee who had worked on February 25th. 
When shown a photo of Black, the attendant said he didn't recognize him. The station's pumps all had credit card slots. No one would have had contact with Black or whoever was using his credit card. The employee didn't recall seeing anyone fitting Mia Giordano's description. Driscoll contacted the Florida Secretary of State Corporation Division to get an address for Valdez exporting. Mia Giordano's company. Okay. Catch you later. Bye. He found no such company registered in the state. He also attempted to locate Mia Giordano herself. We did a very extensive search to identify any Mia Giordano in Florida, and we couldn't find any, I believe, any Mia Giordanos in Florida, or any that would even come remotely close. And we checked Florida as well as New Jersey and with negative results. On March 1st, a detective from the New Jersey State Police traveled to Florida where Frank Black's trail ended. Nobody had heard from Black in five days. Detectives now believe the millionaire had met with foul play. Their most likely suspect, a woman calling herself Mia Giordano, was untraceable. Investigators' focus turned to the phone calls Black received on the days leading up to his trip to Florida. We obtained the phone records of Frank Black, which identified phone calls from a residence in Jupiter. And the residence in Jupiter was rented, it was a, a, a townhome rented by a girl identified as Lisa Costello. She wasn't blonde, but she was five foot one. Mia Giordano had described herself as being exactly that height. The calls from Lisa Costello matched the times when Mia Giordano allegedly phoned Black to set up the meeting in Florida. Mia Giordano was a fictitious figure. She never existed. And she was supposed to set up the deal with Frank Black. Mia Giordano was actually Lisa Costello. Investigators took Costello's photo to the hotel where Black's credit card had been used on February 25th. The resort was on the strip at Riviera Beach. The state agent asked to speak to the clerk who had been on duty the morning in question. While he waited, he checked the phone that had been used with Black's credit card. Like the gas pump, the phone required no signature from a customer, just a credit card. Anyone could have made the calls. Karen Voorhees had worked the front desk on the morning in question. But she did not recognize a photo of Frank Black. She did recall waiting on another customer that morning. At around 2 a.m., a dark-haired woman asked for a room. The hotel was booked, so she used a payphone several times to query other hotels. It was the same time Frank Black's credit card was used at the phone. Voorhees described the woman as being in her 30s with brown hair and standing a little over five feet tall. Driscoll showed Voorhees a photographic lineup of six women. Without hesitation, the clerk picked out Lisa Costello. Lisa Costello was now really the primary suspect. I mean, we did have some evidence on her that then uh, we checked the uh, car rental agencies by the West Palm Beach Airport and found out that Lisa Costello rented a car just shortly before the time that Frank Black's flight arrived. Investigators found the car at the airport rental lot. A subpoena allowed them to impound it for an evidence search by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. But examiners would find no trace of Frank Black in the car. There was no physical evidence linking Lisa Costello 
to the missing businessman. Florida investigators began covert surveillance on Lisa Costello. They followed the suspect for days to establish a routine and determine her contacts. They soon learned that Costello was dating a man named Alan Mackerley. Investigators began to tail Mackerley. Like Frank Black, he also owned a bus company in New Jersey, but was now living in Florida. The two men had known each other most of their lives. Over the years, Alan Mackerley and Frank Black built up a rivalry. The two bus companies are about 10 miles apart. So even though they each had their own contracts and their own business, they were always vying for the same contracts in the same business. Phone records indicated recent calls to Black from Mackerley's Florida home. This seemed strange since the two men were fierce rivals. Detectives went to speak with the manager of Black's bus company. Sally Roberts said Black and Mackerley used to be friends, but their business rivalry had made them enemies. She detailed the last time she had seen the men together. It was at an industry banquet in January of 1996. She and Frank were talking with friends when she saw Mackerley approaching. Angry that Black had stolen one of his major bus contracts, Mackerley threatened his rival. He said he was going to get him and put him under. That could mean put him out of business, and it could also possibly mean he was going to kill him someday. Black took the threat seriously. Afterwards, he wouldn't go to any meeting that Mackerley might attend, unless he had someone with him. Investigators contacted Mackerley to ask him if he had seen or spoken to Frank Black recently. Mackerley flatly denied calling him in the days preceding Black's trip to Florida. Him denying that and us knowing phone, rec phone calls have been made from his house to Frank Black's business obviously uh, indicated something uh, was wrong. Investigators believed that Mackerley and Costello had probably killed Frank Black. But they needed stronger proof. They turned to assistant state attorney Robert Belange. One of the first investigative tools that the FDLE wanted to use was wiretaps. So you have to show uh, a really compelling reason for listening to someone's telephone conversations. So we drafted those applications and orders and obtained uh, an order allowing us to listen to Alan Mackerley's telephone conversations. Unfortunately, investigators heard very few phone conversations between Mackerley and Costello. This was because Costello was now living with Mackerley. If they were talking about Black's disappearance, it wasn't over the phone. In order to record any incriminating conversations, investigators would have to bug Mackerley's house. Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman hoped they had enough probable cause to get inside. Being able to actually enter someone's home and plant a listening device is extremely restrictive, and the, and the probable cause that's required is very high. Uh, the situations that would warrant that are very limited. This case actually presented that situation. A judge signed the warrant, and investigators planted listening devices in Mackerley's home. They set up outside, watching and listening. Got it. Hopefully, the couple would discuss what happened to Frank Black. Alan Mackerley and Lisa Costello were extremely cautious. 
Investigators believe the couple knew they were listening. And every time that we would uh, hear them starting to talk, they would turn the radio up in the kitchen loud. So we probably have several hundred hours of uh, tapes with nothing but put music on it. Once again, investigators came up empty-handed. Our chief assistant state attorney, Dave Morgan, had even commented to me after we failed to get anything on the wiretaps, it looks like Alan McAlee's gotten away with murder. Alan, what are you doing? With Black's body still missing, McAlee and Costello could elude authorities as long as they maintained their silence. In June of 1996, Florida state agents believed that Alan McAlee and his girlfriend Lisa Costello had murdered 58-year-old millionaire Frank Black. But investigators had little evidence against the couple, and Black's body was still missing. They checked morgues in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties where Black was last known to have traveled. There were no unidentified bodies matching Frank Black's description. If Mackerley and Costello had killed Black, they had covered their tracks well. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Michael Driscoll expressed his frustration to his friend, FBI Special Agent Jay Miller. We used to play racquetball together, and he'd ask me about how this case was going, and I'd tell him, you know, a little bit about it, not, not a whole lot. It, and uh, he'd say, well, if you ever need a hand, and uh, I'd be happy to help out. In June of 1996, Special Agent Jay Miller asked to be assigned the case out of the FBI's Fort Pierce resident agency. And even though we were close friends, initially I did not know a lot of the details about uh, Frank Black's disappearance. But uh, as I could sense his frustration, I was able to elicit more information about the case. And uh, we were able then to come to an understanding that we needed to look at this thing again from the start. Though investigators believe McAlee killed Black over a disputed busing contract, wiretaps and listening devices had failed to tie him to any crime. Investigators' best lead was still Black's alleged meeting with Costello. Perhaps if subpoenaed and confronted with the evidence, she would turn on McAlee. It was a gamble that could jeopardize their entire case. By giving anyone, in this case Lisa Costello, a subpoena, it compels her to come in and give information, and it gives her immunity. Hypothetically, if she came in and admitted she killed Frank Black, she would be immune from that statement. You could not use that statement against her. On June 13, 1996, Lisa Costello appeared before a Florida grand jury. I'm not answering that. What is your relationship? When questioned by state attorneys, she was uncooperative and hostile. The judge cautioned her that if she did not answer, she would be jailed for contempt. Costello ignored his warnings. Investigators believed her refusal to cooperate confirmed she was involved in Black's disappearance. But it would take more than a hunch to solve the case. The gamble to subpoena Costello backfired. Now that McAlee's closest ally was sitting behind bars, investigators had no potential witnesses to turn on the suspected murderer. Lacking further leads or physical evidence, the case against McAlee might never make it to trial. Special Agent Michael Driscoll and his team were determined to keep this from happening. We heard information that 
let's just say from a confidential source, that there was a witness who wanted to talk but was concerned about, one, that witness's own involvement, and two, Alan McAlee's violence. Felt that Alan McAlee was a violent person and that maybe there'd be retaliation if this unknown and unidentified witness would, would talk. That witness was Bill Anderson. A former Marine pilot, Anderson was one of Alan McAlee's closest friends. Agents interviewed him at his home in Florida, just down the street from McAlee. Anderson had also owned a bus company in New Jersey and had been a commercial pilot after a decade of military service. So now we had two investigators, Driscoll and myself, and a prosecutor, Alanje, all being Marines, and then the person who we believe could be the key to solving the case, Bill Anderson being a Marine. And so I think there was some camaraderie right there from the start. Investigators felt that bond would help them develop Anderson as a witness. He told the agents his friendship with McAlee had been strained recently, but he was reluctant to detail McAlee's relationship with Frank Black. The agents felt Anderson knew something that could break the case wide open. There was a little hesitancy on his part. We took it easy on him and uh, gave him a little space, gave him the opportunity to do whatever he needed to do, to confer with counsel or whatever. In our minds, we knew that we were talking to the man that had the answers, and he wasn't telling us. The agents met with Anderson on many occasions and slowly won his confidence. Thank you very much for your time. They knew he was loyal to his friend Alan McAlee, but they felt his sense of honor would eventually cause him to turn. Despite Anderson's lingering doubts, agents believed he was ready to talk by early August. They suspected a subpoena would help him justify turning against his friend. In my experience, good, honest, hardworking people that, that flew fighter jets in the Marine Corps would have a difficult time going under oath before the whole world and God and lying about it. Investigators had to take the chance. Like Costello, if Anderson had any part in the crime, his statements could not be used to prosecute him for murder. Five months after the disappearance of millionaire Frank Black, investigators had little evidence to support their theory that Black was murdered by his business rival, Alan McAlee. Looking for a fresh lead, investigators subpoenaed McAlee's close friend, Bill Anderson. Anderson had been reluctant to talk, but after a month, the former Marine's sense of honor prevailed. He began by telling investigators that Alan McAlee had purchased a plane earlier that year. McAlee asked Anderson to become his private pilot since Anderson had experience flying fighter jets and commercial airliners. In exchange, Anderson could use McAlee's plane as he wished. In March of 1996, while staying at a hotel in Leesburg, Florida, to supervise repairs on the plane, Anderson was contacted by McAlee. His friend said he needed him to take the plane out over the ocean. Anderson explained that the aircraft would be grounded for several more days. He suggested they rent another plane McAlee insisted on using his own plane. He didn't want anybody else to know about the flight. Anderson asked why. McAlee told Bill that he had shot Frank Black and that they had wrapped his body up in plastic, that they had taken the body out in the ocean and thrown it out in the ocean, and that the, the bag did not sink. And uh, he went on to tell Bill that it, it didn't sink, so he took a knife and stuck some holes in it, and uh, th the body did sink. McAlee told Anderson he was worried that the body had surfaced. He wanted to fly over the area to make sure it hadn't. 
Anderson refused. Anderson was shocked. I mean, I, I think he was truly shocked. Anderson, again, was in the bus business, as was Mackerley and Black. And uh, Anderson and Black were not friends. Uh, Anderson did not like Black in the least either. But still, over a business rivalry, you don't kill somebody. According to Anderson, Mackerley murdered Black in the foyer of his house. The former Marine pilot confirmed what investigators had suspected all along. It was the big break in the case. I mean, this was the moment we were all waiting for. And <clears throat> I remember explaining to him right away that Bill, we're going to have to do a covert recording of you rehashing this conversation with Alan McAuley. Without a body or murder weapon, they would need McAuley's confession on tape. Anderson's testimony was good, but in court it would be his word against McAuley's. Anderson told prosecutor Robert Belanger that he was reluctant to wear a wire. He was afraid of McAuley because he admitted that he had just killed someone, and McAuley had also told him about a, a, an acquaintance up in New Jersey that got convicted of a crime because someone wore a wire, and he told Bill Anderson, if anyone ever wore a wire on me, I'd kill them. The investigators promised Anderson police protection. He agreed to wear the wire. The plan was to lure Mackerley to Anderson's house. You'll be okay, so don't worry about it. Yeah, this is confidence. This is well concealed. You don't have anything to worry about. FBI techs wired Anderson for sound and hid a video camera in the kitchen. When the equipment was in place, Anderson called Mackerley. He told him he'd been served a subpoena and wanted to talk about what he should do. Mackerley said he would be right over. In case something went wrong, Agent Driscoll would remain hidden in the house to protect Anderson. When the team outside saw Mackerley approaching, they would radio Driscoll to hide. Yeah. Well, in minutes. While waiting, investigators spotted telephone repairmen. Mackerley was paranoid about being bugged. If he saw the workers, he might think they were undercover agents. We knew that if he came to that house and saw these telephone company trucks, that it would have been all over as far as the investigation. Mackerley would be there any minute. The investigators quickly ordered the repairman to leave. They then concealed the dig site. The investigators made it back to the car just before Mackerley pulled up. The investigators tried to alert the men in the house, but they received no response. They radioed again. Still nothing. They had no way to know if Driscoll had received their call. He hadn't. The agent had seconds to hide. Anderson led Mackerley to the kitchen and sat down at the table as planned. He showed Mackerley the subpoena. Mackerley was hesitant to talk. I mean, he wouldn't talk loudly. He was pointing to the walls and saying, no, whispering like this, no, no, nobody knows. Whispering so that he couldn't be heard in Anderson's house. 
Not that he suspected Bill Anderson, but because he expected that the police were everywhere. They were. Detective Liddy and the others listened to McAuley and Anderson from the car. They had a discussion about what Bill Anderson was to testify to and whether or not Bill Anderson should lie for Alan McAuley. Bill Anderson even asked Alan McAuley that if he did uh, refuse to testify and was put in jail, if Alan McAuley would come forward and then tell the truth, and Alan McAuley assured him that he would. McAuley didn't want to continue talking in the house. He led Anderson outside. Anyone else when you told me. No. No this problem. whole thing was supposed to take place at Bill Anderson's kitchen table and no place else. And so when he heard Alan McAuley say, let's take a walk, uh, we were concerned that he was walking Bill Anderson out somewhere to eliminate him. He told anyone else what he told me. No, nobody. The property was if large lie, and covered with dense good. foliage. Will you come they could have walked anywhere. But McAuley unknowingly walked Anderson close to the surveillance team. My car is parked only a matter of probably uh, 80 or 100 feet from McAuley and Anderson. And we could hear distinctly on the transmitter their footsteps as they walked through the gravel and they walked closer to my vehicle with very little coverage concealing my, uh, my vehicle. Four of us sat there frozen in our car wondering is this whole thing going to be blown because he's going to see us? Their case and their cooperating witness were in jeopardy. I'm sorry. If the investigators were discovered, they might not be able to protect Anderson from McAuley's rage. Investigators in Florida watched as cooperating witness Bill Anderson met with murder suspect Alan McAuley. Anderson was wearing a wire, trying to get McAuley to discuss the murder of Frank Black. New Jersey detective Lee Liddy feared what McAuley might do if he caught a glimpse of the nearby investigators. The two of them walked outside, which was very tense for all the investigators involved, because at this point we have no control over what happens, where they go, or what they say. And because they were walking, and because of the pant leg of Bill Anderson rubbing and the movement of the clothes, it was very difficult to pick up conversation. So at that point, we really weren't sure what was happening. Before McAuley could spot the surveillance team, Anderson steered him away. Investigators now had incriminating statements on tape, but not a direct confession. They needed more. McAuley's alleged accomplice, Lisa Costello, remained in jail. She had been charged with contempt of court three months earlier for refusing to honor her subpoena. Agents would seek information from her friends to increase the pressure on the hostile witness. They interviewed Costello's former roommate. She said Costello used to deal cocaine and the sedative rufinol, which is odorless and tasteless. Depending on the dose, rufinol can relax a person or render them unconscious. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll believed Costello sedated Frank Black with the drug. We suspected, matter of fact, from day one, that at some point, Lisa and Frank Black may have gone to dinner or for drinks, and she was able to do that because he would not, he, Frank Black would not willingly or knowingly go into Alan McAuley's house. Hoping this information might pressure her into talking, a prosecutor met with Lisa Costello in jail. He told her that if she didn't cooperate, she would not have immunity. She could be charged with murder. Costello remained silent, despite the warnings of prosecutor Robert Belanger. And Lisa Costello could have walked out of that jail cell any day simply by coming out and honoring that subpoena and telling us what she knew about the case. But she was a tough enough uh, witness that she sat in jail on a civil contempt. 
Despite Costello's silence, investigators pressed on. Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman felt they were ready to arrest. We had a, uh, an ear witness to a confession who was a very close friend of the defendant. We had a motive, we had circumstantial evidence. It was a very strong case. On August 29th, agents began aerial surveillance on Alan McAuley. A ground team assembled around the perimeter of the suspect's house. They made sure he was alone inside. That evening, the arrest team positioned themselves by his door. They would wait until he emerged to take him down in the open. When he stepped out with his dog, the team struck. The stunned suspect offered no resistance. Seven months after Frank Black vanished, Alan McAuley was arrested for kidnapping and murder. With no physical evidence, prosecutors prepared for a difficult trial. When McAuley's arrest hit the news, they received a call from a man with information on the case. The man agreed to give a statement. Robert Senadasian was Alan McAuley's son-in-law. He said that he'd received a call from McAuley on February 25th, the day after Black arrived in Florida. McAuley asked him to come over to help him clean his house. When Sanadasian arrived on Monday, February 26th, he saw that McAuley and Costello had already begun major renovations in the foyer. The carpet had been ripped up, and parts of the wall had been removed. Sanadasian told prosecutor Robert Belanger that McAuley explained why. Alan McAuley told Rob Sanadasian, Frank Black was at my home last Saturday, and even Sanadasian knew the relationship between Alan McAuley and Frank Black and expressed some surprise. Why would, why would Frank Black be at your home? And Alan clearly didn't want to talk about it. He just said, given the O.J. Simpson trial, DNA evidence, we got to make sure there's not even a hair of Frank Black's found in this home. Sanadasian swore that he never saw any blood. Special Agent Miller asked if Sanadasian had questioned McAuley about what had happened. His response was something to the effect that he didn't have to ask his father-in-law, that he knew something really bad had occurred there in the house and that they were, in fact, cleaning up a mess. They used an industrial vacuum cleaner to clean the entire area. Then McAuley asked Sanadasian to help him haul the debris to the local dump. Sanadasian told investigators that he and McAuley discarded sheetrock carpeting and even the vacuum cleaner in the Martin County landfill. His statement corroborated Bill Anderson's story. Anderson told us that McAuley had told him that he had killed Frank Black in the entry to his house. And now we had Sanadasian telling us that immediately after Frank Black's disappearance, he was summoned to that house to do a remodeling job or a, a makeover of the foyer area right where Anderson states McAuley said he shot Frank Black. In the middle of August, an evidence recovery team arrived at the landfill. Based on records, investigators were able to determine where the items were likely dumped six months earlier on February 26th. The recovery team searched for anything that could be traced back to McAuley's home. For three hot days, investigators scoured a specific area of the landfill. The landfill uh, management was able to determine by the date exactly where it was. 
and it was in a spot that was actually feasible and possible that we'd find it. So uh, we did that. We got the equipment uh, with the sheriff's office, crime scene, and so forth, and we dug it up, and we found carpeting that we believed was from Mackley's residence. Investigators found portions of sheetrock and a vacuum cleaner that matched the description Sanitation had given. They brought the items to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensics Laboratory for analysis. Despite their strong suspicions, lab analysts were unable to conclusively match any of the items to Mackley's house. Technicians also processed Mackerley's foyer and retrieved traces of what appeared to be blood. Unfortunately, DNA markers found in the samples could not be exclusively matched to Frank Black's DNA. It was another dead end. Investigators still had no physical evidence. Agents pressed on continuing to build a strong circumstantial case for state prosecutor Belange by further corroborating Sanadazian's story about the cleanup. The FBI went to Walmarts and Kmarts and got receipts where Alan McAuley was buying bleach and Comet and cleaning supplies and trash bags and duct tape and all the tools and implements he needed to clean up a crime scene. Just before trial, investigators received disturbing news. Martin County jail inmates claimed that McAuley had hired someone to kill Bill Anderson. McAuley knew that if he could prevent Anderson from testifying, prosecutors would have to drop their case. Early in 1997, murder suspect Alan McAuley was held without bond for the murder of Frank Black. While he was behind bars, investigators learned he had ordered the murder of witness Bill Anderson. As of that point, um, the security for Bill Anderson tremendously increased, and we began making arrangements uh, to have Bill uh, and his wife go into the uh, Federal Witness Protection Program. McAuley's would-be hitman would not be a reliable witness in court, so attempted murder for hire charges against McAuley were dropped. Alan McAuley's trial began on January 20th, 1998. Even without the victim's body, Florida State Alan Prosecutor Mackley Robert Belanger was confident Frank in the case. There's case law going back to old England where murders have been prosecuted uh, without a body successfully, uh, and the courts have said that we don't reward people because they successfully disposed of the body. You can still prove death through circumstantial evidence like any other fact in the case, by a person's habits and routines, uh, by the fact that they didn't pack for a long trip, um, by declarations of intent, I'm going to go to Florida. Uh, all these things uh, combined demonstrated pretty conclusively that Frank Black was dead. Nevertheless, that is a, a source of frustration. Mr. Mackerley told me the that... The prosecution's the main witness, Bill Anderson, Black recalled what he knew about Frank Black's murder. Prosecutors filled in the gaps and detailed the events of February 24, 1996, the last day Black was seen alive. Mackerley's lover, Lisa Costello, picked up Frank Black at the West Palm Beach Airport that evening. She took him to Mackerley's house on the pretense of meeting other business partners. Black was unaware that he had just stepped into the home of his bitter rival. So how long have you been in the busing business? While Costello and Black discussed the lucrative business deal, prosecutors believe Costello dropped a capsule of Rufinol into his drink. Black would not have noticed. The powerful sedative is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. The two talked while Costello waited for the drug to take effect.
As planned, McAlee took over at that point. Get his wallet. He had Costello remove Black's wallet. Hey, why don't you go get changed? Later, they would use his credit cards to create a false trail for police. Black was powerless due to the heavy sedative. Get up. Finally in control of his rival, McAlee's hatred boiled over. In the foyer, he put a gun to Black's head. McAlee had to get rid of the evidence. He wrapped the body and murder weapon in plastic. Using one of his power boats, he would later dump the body about 16 miles offshore. Took the body out about 20 miles. Anderson testified that McAlee said he had to stab through the plastic in Black's body several times to get it to sink. He then returned home to finish cleaning up. He tore out anything that had been stained by blood or human tissue. Using bleach, they scrubbed the entire area clean. Anderson's testimony was bolstered by powerful circumstantial evidence. Phone calls linking McAlee and Black Robert Sanadajian's story of the cleanup and covert recordings from Anderson's house. Thunder will rise. How do you find the defendant? It was enough to convince the jury. On February 4th, 1998, they found Alan McAlee guilty of kidnapping and murder. After McAlee's trial, prosecutors turned to Lisa Costello. When I looked, I saw the dead body. Faced with murder charges, she finally gave a full statement as to the events that led to Frank Black's death. Ultimately, she entered a plea to third-degree murder and false imprisonment, which are lesser-included offenses. She was sentenced to 10 years in the Florida State Prison. An appeals court overturned McAlee's kidnapping conviction, finding that Frank Black traveled to Florida on his own volition. But the murder conviction stood. Alan McAlee was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Although Frank Black's body has not yet been recovered, his killer, Alan McAlee, will never go free.